Welcome to Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm your host, Sid Evans. And in this episode, I'm talking with someone who comes from Southern rock royalty, but who's also charting his own musical path. Devin Allman grew up in Corpus Christi, Texas and St. Louis, Missouri, and didn't meet his father, Greg Allman, until he was a teenager. A simple letter brought the two of them together. And before long, Devin was going on tour with the Allman Brothers Band and getting to know his dad. In another twist of fate, he met his longtime collaborator, Dwayne Betts, the son of Dickie Betts, founding guitarist for the Allman Brothers. And now the two of them are using all that genetic talent to celebrate their musical legacy and find audiences of their own. We'll talk about all that, the Allman Family Revival Tour, and Devin's recent marriage on this week's Biscuits and Jam. Devin Allman, welcome to Biscuits and Jam. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Where am I reaching you right now? I'm in Clayton, Missouri right now at home, and uh, boy, it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> How do you like it up there? You've spent a lot of years in Missouri around St. Louis. I have, yeah. I've been here a long time now, probably 30 years. I was born and raised in South Texas and ended up here in my high school years. My mom remarried a pilot and he got a gig with TWA Airlines, which was hubbed here in St. Louis. So, you know, if he would have got a gig with Delta, I might be talking to you from Atlanta. Yeah, It's just how fate kind of spins it all out. But through the years, when I've thought about, hey, maybe I'll scoot out of here, something always kind of pulls me back, and it's been home for a long time. So I've always wondered, does St. Louis feel Southern to you or kind of somewhere in between? That's a really good question. It is truly, and I can say this with the education from touring, it is the only city in America where I feel a confluence of all four directions of America. There's mm -hmm. a little East Coast here. There's a little Yankee vibe here. There's a little Southern. And probably the least of that equation is the Western influence because there's not much. But funny enough, as soon as you go down Highway 70, three hours to Kansas City, you start to feel that influx of that Western vibration. So... When you kind of pull a radius around St. Louis, if you go Memphis, it feels very south. Oh, yeah. If you go Indianapolis, it's starting to feel pretty east and north. So St. Louis, is it's the one city that's like that. And it's kind of funny that a lot of companies will do their test runs of products and things here because it's really an amalgam of culture. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it really is. Well, I need to spend a little more time there. But let me ask you about where you grew up, go south for a minute. So you spent most of your childhood in Corpus Christi, Texas. My wife's actually was born there. But tell me a little bit about your connection to that town and what it means to you. So my mom's side of the family was from San Antonio. And my grandfather, it's funny how jobs really kind of dictate these places in our lives. He worked for Napa Auto Parts and they wanted to open a new location in this city that was kind of on the rise and it was Corpus Christi and that's how they ended up there from San Antonio. My mom's side is pretty deep San Antonio for a few generations. So every Thanksgiving, every Christmas, we'd go to San Antonio for the holidays and see the grandparents and everything, great grandparents. But yeah, I mean, growing up there was really amazing. That's where I really fell in love with music and my first concert, my first album, there was a lot of artistic firsts for me in Corpus Christi. So what did your mom do for a living there? Well, initially, when she had met my dad, she had moved up to Houston, and she was working at a concert promotion agency. And she was the intern. She was 20 years old. And the story goes that the Allman Brothers were coming into town to play a show, and they got lost. So, of course, <laughs> the concert promoter sends my mom out to meet them and get them to the gig as fate would have it them getting lost is the reason i'm talking to you today <laughs> <laughs> my father was smitten and things unfolded as they would so she went from kind of just being the cute little intern at the agency to marrying my dad and being kind of thrust into that world 
rather quickly, right as the Allman Brothers were going from a moderately successful band to a major act. Their marriage was short-lived. That was my dad's first wife. They were married for about a year. And then upon returning back to Corpus Christi, she really was kind of an odd jobs kind of person, secretary, intern, you know, like assistant, always kind of trying to better her situation and trying to kind of rebound from going from rock star wife to single mom. It was a tough decade for her. Yeah. So did you grow up spending a good amount of time with your grandparents? I did. Yeah. They lived right down the street and they were truly my core. My grandfather was really my father figure. And that was a relationship that really grounded me in a lot of ways and just taught me a lot. My mom was so young when she had me. She was still kind of a wild child when I was a wild child. So they were a good grounding influence for sure. Yeah. So you left Texas when you were, I think, what, 11, 12 years old. Yeah. But when people grow up in a place like Texas, it can have a pretty profound impact. Do you think of yourself as a Texan? That's really funny that you say that because I've had this conversation with friends and they're like, Texan, you've been in St. Louis for 30 years. <laughs> and I'm like, man, I know I have. However, when the plane lands in Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Corpus, it doesn't matter. And I get that first whiff of Texas. Yeah, I'm home. It's always going to be home. It doesn't matter that I've actually spent more years now in Missouri than Texas. When I go back to Texas, which I still go back quite a bit, it just always feels like home. I think it always will. Your childhood years are the most important, you know, and also any of us that are a little longer in the tooth and over the age of 40 that kind of remember America pre-9-11 and pre-internet and pre AI and pre-COVID, that was a much, much more romantic period of our country's history. It was a much more innocent time. So childhood mixed with that innocence, that nostalgia really, it rings pretty deep for me. I will always be a Texan. I could move to Italy next year and spend the rest of my days there, but I'll still always consider myself a Texan. It's hard to shake, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I get that. And I've heard it from a lot of people. I wonder, does that loyalty also apply to things like football teams? Wow. Do you still have some now, Texas <laughs> affinity there? Uh, now we're getting in there. <laughs> you know, it is funny, though, because for every breath that I will always remain a true Texan, I stick up for the culture and arts and vibe of St. Louis equally. And same goes for loyalty on things like sports. Um, so on the football side of things, I will always be a Houston Oilers fan. And now that team is defunct. Yeah. <laughs> That's a hard one. I kind of started rooting for the Cowboys just for my family's sake and my grandfather and that continuity. But I tell you, I didn't fall in love with baseball until my later years. And what a great baseball town this is. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better baseball vibe than St. Louis. Yeah. So die hard Cardinals fan. You got to be right. Yeah. Yeah. So what about on the food front? I mean, in Corpus Christi, I'm thinking there's a lot of great food in that town and there's yes. a lot of great kind of Mexican influence and all of that. Yeah. What were some of your favorites? Well, those that know, they know Whataburger began in Corpus Christi. The first one was there. So that's a real bragging rights for our city is the birthplace yeah. of Whataburger. I didn't know that. Yeah. And it was just like a little burger shack was all it was. I can't remember if it was the late 40s or late 50s, but yeah, it started there and then it was actually headquartered there for the first few decades. Yeah. We grew up hitting the Whataburger before we would go to Padre Island, the beach there. Great, great Tex-Mex. There's a place called Kiko's there that is just legendary. It's been there for as long as I've been alive and longer. So a lot of really great mom and pop Tex-Mex restaurants. And that's really the pinnacle there. It's really kind of hard to beat. Beyond that, the foodie scene there is slow because everybody just eats Tex-Mex, you know, or, or Whataburgers. <laughs> but just like the rest of the country, it's getting better. But my memories are a lot of enchilada plates. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 
So, Devin, you moved to Memphis, and this is my hometown. And that's a pretty... It's like you read the book that I haven't written yet. (laughs) (laughs) This is... Well, you've got to work on that one. Good chronology here. I'm like, wow, you know your... (laughs) I do know Memphis. I grew up there, and it's a pretty powerful place for a musician. Yeah, it is. What were your years like there, and what kind of influence did Memphis have on you? I moved there when I was 17. I had dropped out of high school to go on tour with the Allman Brothers Band. And when that tour was over, I actually moved in with my dad for a bit. It was the first time we had lived under the same roof. And then I quickly put a band together and we moved from Nashville to Memphis because Memphis was just so much hipper for rock music. So I was 17 when I moved to Memphis and I moved straight into a band house. And what was that like? Rowdy, unruly, unorganized, unethical, (laughs) a lot of uns. (laughs) But the other un, it was a lot of fun. And we learned a lot about what not to do. But that was my first experience of being away from home in a band, writing songs and working up the songs and rehearsing a band and leading a band. And it was an awful band. I mean, it was just awful, (laughs) Uh, terrible, terrible. I mean, we were 17 years old, you know, and everybody wanted to like be Aerosmith or whatever, you know, it was kind of the end of that era of glam metal. But while I was there, the Allman Brothers came into town to record an album called Shades of Two Worlds with legend Tom Dowd. And I was a real punk ass back then, and I didn't know much, but I knew enough to be around for those sessions. And I knew enough to sit back and shut up and listen to Tom Dowd and pay attention and not just be in awe of him and some masters working, but actually pay attention to what he was saying, what he was suggesting, why he was suggesting it, how it bettered the song. And even for being a 17 year old dumbass, I knew enough to go, Man, this is a college education in song craftsmanship and recording that you'll never get again. And I went to those sessions every day and fly on the wall, just listened. And I'm really grateful for that. Memphis has a strong vibe. I ended up making a lot of my records there and producing some records there as well. And when I still go back there, it still feels a little bit like home. There's a little Memphis in me, for sure. You mentioned your dad, Greg Allman, and you didn't really know him until you were, you said, 16 or 17. Yeah. How did you get to know him after all that time? I mean, was this something that you initiated or did it just kind of happen? You know, zero contact between me and my father for the first 16 years of my life, 15 years of my life. 15 years. So it was 87. At this point, I was living in Mobile, Alabama, actually. I went to my sophomore year at Murphy High. And I saw him on, I think it was MTV. And I was like, man, I'm going to write him a letter. So I wrote him a letter and it was just three sentences long. Hey, I'm your son. (laughs) Here's my phone number. I play guitar. I like Ozzy Osbourne. Hit me up. (laughs) Like it was, you know, like what a 15 year old would say, right? (laughs) I wish I still had that. Um, Anyway, we're talking 15 years of zero contact. So never a call, never a card, never anything in the mail or just no acknowledgement, which was hard as a young, young guy and hard as a teenager and just hard, just bewildering. Like why, you know? So I wrote him that letter, and I think it was four days, five days later, um, the phone rang, and it was my dad. And I was, I was really impressed that he worked up the nerve, the courage, the whatever, to make that call. So he made that call, and, and we were just instantly kind of thick as thieves. We were a lot alike. We had a very similar sense of humor. And he said, hey, well, I'm going to be on tour. Let's connect. And so I said, sure. And it was, I don't know, four months or something later, five months, I had already relocated to St. Louis and he came to play the Fox Theater and 
I drove my Datsun B210 to the Fox Theater, and I sat on the hood smoking a Marlboro Light, a punk-ass 16-year-old, and up drives a tour bus, and I'm like, wow, my heart's racing. I'm like, you know, this is it. And a couple guys kind of stumble off the bus, and then there's the guy with the long blonde hair, right? And I remember that the internal, uh, I don't know why I got emotional. Uh, sometimes it just really missed dad. I remember the internal dialogue being, that's your dad, man. You know, and that was, uh, that was a moment for sure. And then we, uh, hung out backstage and just laughed and he went on stage and played. I remember him being really nervous. He was really nervous. And I know it was me and the gig because he got stage fright. Really? Yeah. He got stage fright every time, even later in life. And he'd be the first to tell you first or second note of that first song, that's gone. But right. leading up that hour before he's, you know, <laughs> but it was pretty wild. I remember turning around after we hung out and I was heading to my car and I walked back and I said, Hey, I got a question for you. And he's like, what's that? And I said, 15 years? Like, why didn't you? Because we had such a great night. And I could tell it was a relief for him to make that connection. And he pulled his wallet out and he pulled out this piece of paper and he unfolded it. And it was my letter. Oh, wow. He had it in his wallet for that five months between the phone call and the meeting. He said, I was waiting for this. <laughs> And I was like, oh, son of a bitch. Like, he was waiting for his kid to make the first move. Like, wow. Okay. <laughs> I'd have done it sooner. <laughs> so it's just one of those things. And we ended up being really, really close, man. And we had a lot of ups and we had some downs. And there was tough times in there when he was battling his demons. Um, and there was times where I was right by his side. And there was times where I said, I can't, my boundaries are beyond stretched, you know. There were some times that were really tough. But overall, I mean, man, we were tight. And I love that guy. And I miss that guy so much. Well, what a gift that you had all the time with him that you did. Definitely. I wanted to ask you about, you know, you lost your dad in 2017. And it seemed to have a very profound impact on you. I think you took off touring for a while. You had to kind of take a break and wanted to spend some time with the family. I mean, what had your relationship become by that point? Were you, you know, in regular contact all the time? Were you playing music together? Yeah. I mean, once that initial meeting was over, I came out on a lot of tours and then I started becoming an opening act on a lot of tours. And we were close. I mean, we did all the Christmases and stuff together. He would come to me for advice, which I really appreciated. You know, one time he even said, hey, you ever think when you met your dad that you'd be the dad? You know, he said that before. And I really, um, that really touched me because he grew up without a dad. And I think he knew that in me, he had a confidant. He had someone that wouldn't just say yes all the time. He had someone that would shoot it to him straight, whether he wanted to hear it or not. He had somebody he could trust, you know. So we had a very close bond because of that, because he didn't have much of that in his life. There's a lot of people saying yes and yes, man. And people in the industry, they just want to hang out with him to be cool. And I tell you what, when he did something that wasn't thoughtful or insensitive, I let him have it. And I was the only one in his life that would do that. And he'd listen. So we had a unique relationship. You know, it was son, father, it was brother, brother, it was confidant, it was a lot of different things. But yeah, I'm blessed that we had that, even though we missed those first 15 years together. It's like we really made up for lost time. We got very close. Mm. And um, losing him was really tough. Um, half of me thought we got an extra 20 years out of this guy. Like he really, you know, he should have been gone by 50 the way that he lived. Everybody knows he lived so hard for decades. And so that half of me was ready for that horrible phone call every day. Every day I was ready for that call. Or not ready, but in fear of getting that call. And then the other half of me is like, he's made it this far. He's going to live till 90. 
And of course, things unfold as they're going to unfold. And that was a hard day. It was really hard for me because four, four and a half months prior, I lost my mom. And that was the one that was like, I just thought I'd have her forever, you know? And actually the day after my mom died, I got a phone call to go down and spend some time with dad because we're, you know, quote unquote, we're losing him. I was like, I just lost my mom last night. And my dad hung on for a handful of months after that. But yeah, the double shot was soul crushing. It was really tough. And when mom died, I took a couple months off from touring to just spend some time healing. And I got back out on the road and dad passed about a month later. And I canceled the rest of that year because of a few reasons. Number one, I wanted to heal. That hurt. Losing them both like that was just, ugh. And two, I wanted to be able to be able to be there for my siblings whenever they wanted me. You know, I'm the oldest. So like, oh, can you come out for the weekend or whatever? I wanted to kind of have free reign to do that, to be there for them. And we did spend a lot of time together when he passed. And that was crucial for all of our healing was to bring it in and be together. And the third is if I had concerts a month after my father passed, all the energy in the room would be about his passing. And I didn't feel like that was fair to him or my music. Like, let's let some time pass and reconvene. But the bummer about that approach was that a few months after he had passed, I realized I was denying myself the healing power of togetherness with music. And I was really anxious to get back out there. And the revival concerts were born out of that. Yeah, what a year for you. But it is interesting that as you overcame that and worked your way through it, it's also kind of when you found this musical outlet and this kind of new musical journey working with Dwayne Betts. Yeah, for sure. After the break, I'll talk more with Devin Allman about his music, his dad, and his collaboration with the son of another Allman Brothers Band veteran. Welcome back to Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm Sid Evans, and today I'm talking with the musician Devin Allman. I want to talk about your music. You know, for the last few years, you've been recording and touring with Dwayne, and he's the son of Dickie Betts, of course, who's another founding member of the Allman Brothers. Talk to me about him just on a personal level and what your connection is like with Dwayne. Sure. Yeah, we met on that tour that I was talking about. I left high school to go on that reunion tour in 89. And we met literally on the tour bus. I remember dad saying, hey, go drop your bag on the bus. Dickie's kid's in there. Go say hello. (laughs) I'm like, all right. I get on the bus and he's sitting there with some headphones on. And I mean, it looks like a miniature Dickie Betts, you know, (laughs) I'm just like, Wow. This kid, it's like Dickie spit him out. I think I'm 17, and I guess Dwayne's 11. I think that's our age difference, 12, something like that, which at the time seemed like quite a bit of an age difference. The other guys were trying to sneak beers and chase girls, and he's a kid, you know? (laughs) But I'm like, hey, man, and he kind of ignored me. I'm like, hey, hey, man. And he finally looks up, and I go, what are you listening to? He's got the headphones on and he just kind of goes, what? And I go, what are you listening to, man? And he goes, Testament, (laughs) which was like a big 1980s thrash metal band. And especially with my Texas roots, I had been a thrash metal fan for some years, you know, Metallica and Slayer and, and all of that. And this is before that music really kind of exploded. So when you were into that, you were kind of one of the cool kids. And I think I name dropped one of their records. And I was like, well, are you listening to Practice What You Preach? And he just kind of gave me a look like, oh, you're all right. So I instantly really loved his attitude. And I really loved his energy. I really did. But we were enough age difference where I was like, well, have fun. We're going to go sneak beers and chase girls. But later in life, as we got older and we got into our 30s or 40s, we were running into each other 
on like a cruise ship that my band was playing and Dickie Betts band was playing. Dwayne Betts was in Dickie Betts band as the second guitar player. We ran into each other backstage in London. He was playing with someone. I was doing my thing. And we'd always laugh about being kids on the All My Brothers tour. So we always had that family connection and that kinship. And there was times where my band would play Florida and he'd come out and sit in and we'd go over to a mutual friend's house and jam guitars, you know. So there was always these times where we were kind of catching up. It's not like we grew up together and were inseparable or anything or never lived in the same city or anything like that. But we had this bond that was that reunion tour and that bond just always kept us close. So when dad passed away, I thought, well... I'm ready to play music again and go out and play live. And I'd like to just have a big party for dad. It was going to be his 70th birthday. And I'm like, why don't we invite some friends and have a big throwdown in dad's honor, you know, a big revival. And Dwayne was on board. And now we're going on our eighth year with the revival series. It's a tremendous time for Dwayne and I to tip our hats to our dads. It's only three weeks. That's it. For 20 shows a year, we will go out and play All My Brothers music, and we curate the experience to invite some really lovely names in the music community. I get to kind of play the part of a casting director more than anything. Like, oh, who's going to do Melissa this year? Who's going to do Whip and Post this year? That's a really fun thing for us to curate. And then also born out of that initial concert in 2017 was the idea of, this is fun. Why don't we start a band together? Let's go out on tour together. And Dwayne, you open for me. And we'll spend our time on the buses and backstage and try and write some songs. And if we write some, awesome. Then we got a band. And if we try and write some and it's not what we like, then it's okay. We try it. And we did have a chemistry writing songs, not just because you got an almond and a best, but we could actually sit down and write a tune together. And then singing together, it turns out that the timbers of our voices work together. Just instant chemistry, no effort, just right in that pocket, just right in the cut. And then Almond Betts Band was born. So, you know, it turned out to be a really important concert. You know, we threw a party for dad and it's almost like dad said, okay, well, here you go. Now you get to play once a year and have a band. You can't script that. Yeah. Let's talk about the Almond Betts Band a little bit. I mean, you've got the spring tour coming up. Like you said, yeah. you've been on hiatus. I mean, what feels different about this tour than others that you've done before? I don't know that much feels different. I think that we've missed playing these songs and being together. The fans have missed this band together. I've done some solo touring. Dwayne's done some solo touring. I did a collaborative project last year with Donovan Frankenreiter, where we set up to break the world record for playing all 50 states in the least amount of time, which we broke that record, which was insane. Um, <laughs> Congratulations. So anyway, I digress. You know, it was really great to have some time to put into some solo endeavors, and we're still working on solo endeavors. This is just, a, hey, man, we miss playing this music, and we miss playing for our fans, and we know that our fans love seeing Dwayne and I together in a project, so this is a way to go reconnect with them and we're still working on solo records and touring and different projects and collaborations, but we always have the Almond Betts band to kind of pick up and work on whenever we want. Yeah. You know, you mentioned a couple albums. You've got one called Down to the River and another one called Bless Your Heart. And I wanted to ask you about a song on Bless Your Heart, and it's called Magnolia Road. It's a great song. It's kind of autobiographical. But ironically, I think it was written by your collaborator, yes. uh, Stoll Vaughn. <laughs> Tell me about that. Like, how did that kind of come together? It's just so funny that our most known song and arguably most personal, it wasn't even written by us. I don't consider that embarrassing at all. Keep on 
I actually consider that to be quite a victory for the really talented Stahl Vaughn. He's an exceptional songwriter and collaborator. He's done stuff with John Cougar Mellencamp, and Dwayne Betts had worked with him and suggested him for the songwriting trio to have someone to kind of play interference. And he was great. What he brought to the table was a lot of organization. He would collect the riffs and the lyrics and had folders with, well, why don't we work on this one today and let's work on this one. But he was really good about, in the in-between times, talking to us, getting to know us, talking about our histories. And he wrote that based on the history that he knew and we were just flabbergasted. It was such a touching portrait of who we are and where we come from that we would have never written ourselves, you know? And that's really what was amazing. He says a whole lot about us in just a few short lines. Devin, back in 2022, you sang for the first time at the Grand Ole Opry. Yes. And that must have been a thrill for you. You did a beautiful thing on that occasion. You sang a version of These Days by Jackson Brown with the singer Maggie Rose. And I think it was a kind of a tribute to your father. How did that come together? For the Revival Tour 2022, Maggie was selected to be on that tour and graciously accepted and was a, a great part of that tour. And I don't know, it was a few months out. It was kind of once we had hired her onto the tour and she hit me and she goes, hey, I got an idea. I always love that song these days. Why don't we do our own version? We can use it to promote the tour. And I'm like, I would have never thought to cover that song. And it's one of my favorite songs of all time. I'd be honored to do that song with you. So I took dad's two favorite guitars and drove down to Nashville and and handed the one to Maggie, and we sat down, and I just told them, cats, I said, hit record, and we're going to play this in a loop, and I'll bet you the third or the fourth one is going to be the one. And they did, and I think we sing the very last line of the song, and then I just kept tapping my foot, and then we'd go right back into it, start it, and we played it all the way down six or seven times, and I think they kept number four, and what you hear is live. It's one pass. And she's a phenomenal singer and what a sweetheart. And then I guess a month later, we brought it to life at the Grand Ole Opry. And that was a supreme honor. And then every night on Revival, we got to do These Days in the Encore, a real quiet, poignant moment in the song with the slideshow of Dad through the years. Hmm. It was really sweet. And I was really grateful to bring that song to life with her. And I remember I texted the song our version to Jackson Brown. And he said he loved it. And I texted it to Cher. And she said that she cried. And I was just like, wow, man, you know, just blown away. Well, it's a great song. And what a great moment and tribute to your dad. Thank you very much. So, Devin, you had a pretty big year last year in a lot of ways. You may not have been touring with Almond Betts, but you did get married. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about your wife and how y'all met. My wife is a doctor. She had her doctorate at age 24, chiropractor, functional medicine. She owns her own practice. She's a very savvy lady. We met through mutual friends, Blackberry Smoke. And when we first met, we just went and had a coffee. And then a month later, we had dinner. And it was just kind of one of those things where it wasn't just explosive out the gate. It was just kind of tentative. I was getting over losing my parents and on the road with Almond Betts Band. I knew we were going to play and play and play for a couple of years straight. So she kind of was coming in at kind of a tough time. So we really took it really slow, you know. But yeah, we got married in May and we had this insane six stop honeymoon which was like its own world tour <laughs> we did south africa dubai oman milan and lake como and it was just magical what can i say she really balances me out you know she's a terrific person she does so much for so many people not to mention I think every single person in my band and crew has gone to her practice to get something worked on. Adjusted. <laughs> She's just one of those people. She does so, so much for so many people, and she is an absolute inspiration to me. And just really, really happy that we found each other and that we tied the knot in May. So That's great. Well, congratulations. Thank you so much. Well, Devin, I just have one more question for you. You got it. What does it mean to you to be Southern? Oh, that's a great question. 
I think there was all those negative connotations to Southerners that stem so far back from the previous centuries. And the thing that I like about the South and where I think that Southern charm is born and where I think Southern hospitality originates is that we take our time. And it's not because we're lazy. We are enjoying the flavor of this life. And that's what it means to me to be Southern. Mm, well said. Well, Devin Allman, thanks so much for being on Biscuits and Jam. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Devin Allman. Southern Living is based in Birmingham, Alabama. Be sure to follow Biscuits and Jam on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And we'd love your feedback. If you could rate this podcast and leave us a review, we'd really appreciate it. You can also find us online at southernliving.com slash biscuits and jam. Our theme song is by Sean Watkins of Nickel Creek. I hope you'll join me next week when I'll be talking with the Grammy award-winning blues man, Cedric Burnside. We'll see you then. Mm-hmm.